as we turn to looking at teaching model number two, we're going to introduce a couple of parameters that can be used to describe an ideal gas. I'd like to first of all look at the units that we use to represent them. So of course, for the amount, we talk about moles. For pressure, you're going to be surprised by the number of different units that we use to describe this parameter. Now all of these units are also shown in your formula sheet. So you're responsible to know how to interconvert, but you don't need to memorize these units. So I'm starting off with some more conventional units, but later we'll be also including the bar. So for instance, we say that one atmosphere is equivalent to 760 millimeters of mercury, 760 torr, and 101.3 kilopascals. In this lesson, we'll be specifically looking at why do we have these units, millimeters of mercury and torr. Volume is represented by the unit liters, and of course milliliters as well. And of course, there's some equivalencies with centimeters cubed and decimeter cubed. Temperature. Now, of course, often in everyday life, we work in degrees Celsius. But when we're dealing with gases, it'll be particularly important to work in Kelvin. So as it turns out, zero Kelvin, which is also known as absolute zero, is equal to negative 273.15 degrees Celsius. Another way of thinking about this is zero degrees Celsius is actually equal to 273.15 Kelvin. It's possible to have negative values in the Celsius scale, but absolute zero is considered to be the lowest temperature in the Kelvin scale, and you can't go below it. As it turns out, scientists have never actually achieved absolute zero, although they've gotten very, very close. I find it helpful to make a little t-chart like this to help me see the relative conversions. So for instance, the lowest temperature in Kelvin is zero Kelvin. It's equivalent to negative 273.15. Now as it turns out, although these scales start at different spots, the interval is the same. So now if we go up by 273.15 units, we'll end up at 273.15 Kelvin and zero degrees Celsius. If we go up another 100 degrees Celsius, well then we go up 100 units in the Kelvin scale. So 100 degrees Celsius, of course the boiling point of water under one atmosphere pressure is equal to 373.15 Kelvin. Here's another temperature. You may want to reflect for a minute what would be the degree Celsius that corresponds to this Kelvin temperature. So of course the difference between 273.15 and 223.15 is 50 units. So this would be negative 50 degrees Celsius. We use capital K to represent the units for Kelvin, but if you were to write it out, we'd actually write it out like this, lower K, and then we'd say Kelvins. So that's how we represent those particular units. As mentioned, you should be quite comfortable already with volume and temperature and amount, but pressure is a rather unique parameter, and it's unique in a sense to the properties of gases. So let's explore a little bit more this parameter. So pressure, according to physics, is defined as a force per area. So we have to ask ourselves, well, why would a gas exert a force over an area? And essentially it's because of the collisions of the gaseous particles with the walls of the container. So this little animation gives you a sense of that. The gaseous particles are constantly in motion and colliding with the walls of the container. Now any one particle would not exert much force on the wall of the container. But the fact that we have billions and billions of particles hitting the walls of the container, there's a considerable force. I'd like to emphasize again that our model of gaseous particles are such that the particles themselves are very, very tiny and there's a lot of space between each of the particles. The volume of the container, of course, defines the volume of our gas. Now you might wonder how it is that we came upon this idea of gaseous particles and what causes this force. Some of the experiments involved a can-crushing experiment 
and then an experiment that was demonstrated by Otto von Gerich, who was the mayor of Magdeburg in what is now Germany. I will present these as evidence that pressure is due to the collision of gaseous particles on the walls of the container, and that this is a considerable force. So here is a classic example of a can crushing experiment. So in this video, you'll see that there'll be a little bit of water that will be put into our can. The water will be heated to boiling, and then the can will be moved and put into this beaker of cold water. So let's see what happens. So I come back to this spot in the video and picture at the point that the water is boiling inside this can, then the space above the boiling water will essentially be due to water vapor only. When this can is inverted and put into the cold water, the water vapor here condenses very quickly, and therefore temporarily there's less pressure inside the can. There's a significant air pressure on the outside, however, which indeed causes the can to be crushed as such. So that crushing effect is evidence for the great pressure of air due to those collisions of the air particles with their containers, <laughs> whether that container be a can of pop or the walls that surround you right now. Here is another piece of evidence for the fact that there's tremendous air pressure being exerted all the time around us. As mentioned, this is an experiment that was demonstrated by Otto von Gerich in 1654. And he demonstrated this in front of the Emperor Fernand III in Regensburg. And this is in current Bavaria, Germany. Now, to give you a sense of this experiment, I'd like to introduce you to the Magdeburg spheres. So I'm going to show you now a different video. So here we have two students. And what they're going to do is put together two hemispheres, if you will, two sides of a sphere so that then they'll have one uniform sphere. And they'll show you that before doing anything, they can simply pull apart these spheres. But then when they evacuate the air within the spheres and then try to pull apart, it's much more difficult. So let's see. So you can see no effort in pulling those apart, as long as they don't drop them. So now they put the spheres together. They hook up a vacuum pump. They run it for a few seconds. And now they try to separate the spheres. So you can see they were successful at separating the spheres. However, if they had actually completely evacuated the air from those spheres, they would not have been able to separate the spheres because air pressure is very, very significant and they would not have had enough force to do so. Let's now go to the experiment by Otto von Gerich. So here's a painting representing this experiment. So one of the things that Otto von Gerich had going for him is he had invented an air pump. And the idea is that he was able to take this sphere made up of two hemispheres and evacuate using his vacuum pump the air. There's essentially a vacuum inside these spheres. He then harnessed 15 horses on one side and 15 horses on another and had the horses run in opposite direction. The horses were not able to separate the spheres. Again, because air pressure is so significant on the outside of these spheres, and there is no pressure pushing from the inside. Then what he was able to do, much to the astonishment of onlookers, is he, of course, would have a little valve here that he could turn, and that would allow air now to enter inside these spheres. 
once the air had entered, well, then he was able to go up to the spheres and separate them himself. So people would have thought this would have been an extremely magical demonstration because they would have not understood the nature of a vacuum pump and how air pressure could exert such a force. Because when you're in the middle of experiencing that air pressure, you have no idea that that's what's happening. Some of you might be wondering, well, why aren't we being crushed by the surrounding air? So fortunately, our bodies also have air within and pushing outwards. So fortunately, we are okay that way. <laughs>